Welcome to the place where people of faith find real answers. We believe women deserve more than just religious band-aids for their most difficult and destructive relationships. And now for today's episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Julie Sedanko here with best-selling author and relationship expert, Leslie Vernick. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Unfortunately, domestic violence happens even in Christian homes. Today, we're gonna to talk about dealing with domestic violence biblically. But before we get started, let's define what we mean by domestic violence. Leslie? You know, there's no specific action other than the desire to control another. It can be done lots of ways. So when we look at the Bible's word for this, it's called oppression. And when oppressors oppress, they tend to um, do it either physically or emotionally or manipulatively, um, but they're trying to get control over someone, take away their voice, take away their choice. So when we look at that in a home, when we call it domestic violence, we're actually looking at a power over someone. So when we think about uh, a man having power over a woman, he may use his fists and scare her or beat her, or he may use the Bible to have power over her where she doesn't have a choice. She doesn't have a voice and she's just to be under him, not in a headship submission, biblical way. They may use those words and try to get power over them, but not the way God intended headship and submission to be. Headship and submission is not where a woman now becomes a child in a marriage and she has no choice or no voice. And so domestic violence really is about power over someone to gain control over their voice and their choice so that they do what you want them to do and they don't do what you don't want them to do. And it's as simple as that and as complicated as that because there's lots of both overt strategies that someone might use that is very obvious, like punching someone to get them to comply or just confusing them, gaslighting them and not knowing what's true, getting them to comply. This isn't a rare occurrence in the church, is it, Leslie? Unfortunately, it's not. And again, if we know what to look for, um, we can see it more clearly. But one in four Christian women report being in an emotionally destructive marriage. Now, that may not involve what we would typically think of as violence, hitting, aggressive, beating someone or uh, restraining them, those kind of things. When we talk about the broader scope of taking away someone's voice and someone's choice, someone's agency to make decisions for themselves, to think for themselves, to um, decide for themselves. This can be very potent in a Christian home, especially because of the misuse of headship and submission passages, which then give extra authority to the controller's point of view is that I have God's sanction to have power over you because you are my wife, which then objectifies her to the role of wife versus a person in God's image. Can a woman be guilty of domestic violence? It's a tricky way of looking at it. If we look at violence as control over, certainly a woman could be guilty of domestic violence toward her children because she's usually stronger. She's usually more powerful. She's usually um, able to use uh, violent methods if she's an abusive parent to control or get her children to comply. Um, that's not so true with a man. Usually men are not scared of their wives. Um, women are often scared of their husbands. Husbands have louder voices. They have bigger bodies. They have uh, more financial control usually, and certainly more spiritual authority given to them by the church to have control over their family. They're mandated to have control, so to speak, over their family. So a woman can be violent. She can stab her husband or shoot her husband every bit as much as he could stab or shoot her. It's often not to control him. It's often because she's angry at him or she's reacting to something he did or um, she doesn't like him. Um, lots of reasons. And it's just as lethal, but perhaps the underlining dynamics a little different. So why, especially in the church among Christians, would a man hurt his wife like this? You would think that there would be a difference between Christians and non-Christians, especially in this area. Well, you'd think, but we see lots of sinful things going on in churches because people are sinners. And whether the church is oppressing people in a sort of you do it our way or leave um, mentality, which is, again, taking away people's agency and choice. Like, I don't get to decide what I believe or who I talk to. The church decides that for me. And that's an oppressive environment. We sometimes call them cults, but sometimes 
churches are cultish when they start being that way. But why would a husband believe that he's entitled to control his wife? I think that sometimes men grow up in those kind of homes. Sometimes they gravitate towards very patriarchal, authoritarian kind of church cultures where that is reinforced. They wouldn't reinforce hitting your wife. Although, you know, I've been in the Middle East and it is reinforced that if you have to hit your wife to get control over her, that's what you have to do. So mm -hmm. there's different cultures that may enforce a man's right to have control, physical control, spiritual control, emotional control, financial control over uh, his wife and his children and his family and call that God's definition of headship. So I think it can be very confusing for uh, a woman who wants to honor God, especially when she's in a more conservative, uh, a patriarchal, authoritative environment to know where it crosses the line. Where does headship and submission stay biblical? And when does it cross to the line to oppressor, oppressy relationship? So when does it cross the line? I think it crosses the line when a woman is objectified. She is not a person to love. She's an object to you. So she becomes the wife. You're the maid, the mom, the sex partner, the provider, whatever it is that she is as a role, or even he can be objectified in some ways as the provider without recognizing that, yes, we do a role, but we are also a person. And when God created people, he created them with agency. He created them with choice. He gave Adam and Eve choice and they had the choice to disobey him. He didn't power over them. He didn't control their choices. They controlled their choices and Adam didn't control Eve's choice. We have no model for uh, that in the Bible for marriage or God's way of leadership. In fact, when he was talking to the disciples about leadership and giving his disciples power over his authority in the church, he said, hey guys, I'm going to give you leadership and the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But don't lord over others like the Gentiles do. That's not my way of leadership. And then he told them, if you want to be first, if you want to be the leader, you get to serve first. That's Jesus's definition of leadership, not bullying people, bossing people around, telling them what to do, shouting in their face that you're the leader and they have to listen. That's not ever a biblical description of leadership, not for government or for households, or for leaders in the church. And so when someone takes these passages about, well, God said I'm the head, and that means I get to bully you, or I get to control you, or I get to micromanage your life, that's not a proper understanding of leadership or headship biblically. And also submission biblically is a choice that someone makes voluntarily. It's not something that you're forced into. That's not the word submission, then it's called coercion or intimidation. So when you submit, you choose to submit. You don't get forced or scared into submission. That's not the biblical word for submission then. Isn't there some truth that maybe she has provoked the abuse because of her behavior or her attitude? I mean, sometimes we don't make it easy for these guys. You know, you're absolutely right, Julie. I think that we can provoke people into feeling a lot of feelings. I don't know about you, but my children used to provoke me <laughs> all kinds oh of feelings too, yes. you know, um, and, and when I would sit in traffic, that would provoke me. And when I would get, you know, a slow clerk in the grocery store line, that would provoke me. So the truth is, of course, of course, a wife can provoke her husband and a husband can provoke his wife. Of course, our children provoke us. Of course, life provokes us. I mean, there is no like cotton candy land that there is no provocation or no one who irritates us or aggravates us. Our barking dog at five o'clock in the morning provokes us. So the question really becomes when we get provoked, whether it's in marriage and parenting in everyday life, who's responsible for managing me? So I'm provoked. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed by what you did or what you didn't do. You provoked me all right, I'm feeling it feelings. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling upset. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling tired of this. Whatever I'm feeling, who's responsible to manage those emotions, me or the person who provoked me? So we see a really good example of this in the Bible where Moses was legitimately provoked by the Israelites' disobedience to God. He was. And at one instance, he threw down the Ten Commandments. He was so upset with them creating that golden calf, with Aaron allowing that. Another time he whacked the 
the staff on the on the rock and God said Moses <laughs> you're not entering the promised land yeah Moses was legitimately provoked and Moses was held accountable for Moses temper outbursts so I think it's really important for us to understand that especially if we're a pastor listening to this or we're a women's ministry leader and we may see a woman who is a little mouthy, a little disrespectful in the way she talks to her husband, all of those things. And that might be a different conversation to have with her, but not in front of her husband if he's been abusive to her, because that really then reinforces his belief that, well, it's your fault I acted this way. I mean, in the same way with adultery, they might have sexual problems in a marriage, but if he says, well, it's your fault then I watch porn, or it's your fault that I committed adultery, um, we're not serving either part of that equation because what we're saying is you are not responsible for you. She's responsible for you. She's responsible for your temper. She's responsible for your sex life. She's responsible for how you handle yourself. And that's just not biblical. That's not biblical. And that's a terrible burden to put on another person that I'm totally responsible for how someone else behaves. So what should a pastor or people helper in the church do if a woman comes and says she's being abused in her home. I think you uh, provided some statistics here. And I think it's really important because these are very real statistics. And I think it's um, important for us to realize as church leaders, as people who attend church, that domestic violence, including lethal violence, is very real here in the United States. And we often read in the newspaper or hear in the news of a woman or a woman and her children being shot or murdered by their father and husband. And so this isn't something that we should take lightly. Every nine seconds in the United States, a woman is assaulted or beaten. And around the world, at least one in every three women has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in her lifetime. And most often, this abuser is someone in her family. Domestic violence is the leading cause of injuries to women more than car accidents, muggings, and rapes combined. This is staggering. Studies suggest that up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually. And let me just say in that instance, when children are living in a fear-filled environment, even if the abuser isn't directly abusing them, that affects their development because you cannot grow intellectually, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, when you're living in fear. All you're thinking about is how do I survive? You're not thinking about how to do my multiplication tables. And so it's really important that moms or pastors, especially pastors who say, well, God wants you to stay together for the children. The children are being harmed in this environment as well. Nearly one in five teenage girls who have been in a relationship said a boyfriend threatened violence or self-harm if she didn't want to be with him anymore. In others, I'm going to hurt myself if I can't control you and you have to stay with me. Every day in the United States, more than three women are murdered by their husbands or boyfriends. And, you know, when we think about domestic violence being mutual, like is a woman domestically violent toward her husband? Yes. But when we look at these statistics for men, it is far less that a woman murders her husband. We hear of it, but not like we hear of it with men murdering women. Domestic violence victims lose nearly 8 million days of paid work per year in the United States. That's the equivalent of 32,000 full-time jobs. And based on reports from 10 countries, between 55% and 95% of women who had been physically abused by their partners had never told anybody, contacted government shelters or organizations or the police. So the stats that we're hearing about are about half of the stats that are really out there. The cost of intimate partner violence in the United States alone exceeds $5.8 billion per year 4.1 billion are for direct medical and healthcare services, while productivity losses account for nearly 1.8 billion. And men who as children witnessed their parents' domestic violence were twice as likely to abuse their own wives than sons of nonviolent parents. This, this should break our hearts. This, yeah. is, this is an epidemic and this should break our hearts. Nowhere more so than in the church where God created marriage to be a loving and safe partnership. In Proverbs 31, marriage is described in this way. It says he trusts her or she trusts him to do them good, not harm 
all the days of their life. And so domestic violence of any kind, but especially where there's injuries and hitting, creates a lack of safety and a lack of trust, completely different than what God's design for marriage was to be. God's design for marriage was to be a place where there was safety and trust for everyone in that family to grow and to thrive. And so as a church, we must recognize where this oppressive control comes in, domestic abuse comes in of any shape, any kind, any form, even if it's, even if it's financial abuse or spiritual abuse and he never hit her, it's still abuse. It's still, it may not be violent abuse, but it's still abuse. Those really are staggering statistics. It makes me angry in some ways because I, I talk to these women who over and over and over again go to their churches and are told to submit. And that has to stop. Yeah, I mean, I think submission is, let's just unpack submission for a minute. We have a whole podcast on headship and submission. So um, that will be for another day. But I think that submission is a good discipline. So we don't want to say, oh, women should never have to submit. Women and men in the Bible are called to submit. Submit to one another, Ephesians 5, 1 says. Well, what is submission? Submission is yielding your will to another, but it's not your will being taken by another. It's yielding your will to another for the greater good. Not everybody can have their way all the time, right? You just you can't function as a family, as a church, with everybody saying, I'm right, I want my way. And so part of working in a family or working in a community peacefully is submission, saying, hey, I don't have to have my way. I can give in. But that's something you choose to do for the welfare of all. It's not something that you're forced to do because you're afraid of being beaten if you don't. And so this is really important that when we teach submission in a church to our children or when we talk about it from the pulpit, um, we understand and we teach what submission really looks like and that it's not just for women or for wives. All believers are called to submit, for example, to authority. All believers are called to submit to one another and all believers are called to submit to God. And so it's not just a woman's role to learn this. Children need to learn to submit to their parents. Wives may need to learn to submit to their husbands. Husbands may learn to need to learn to submit to their wives once in a while. And so it's not just a feminine issue. It's a humanity issue that submission is a good thing. And it's a good discipline to learn as is other disciplines. But when the church tells a woman to submit to sinful behavior, right, that's Absolutely not what God tells them to do, because he says, submit as unto the Lord. And God would never ask a woman to submit to an oppressor willingly. She may have to yield to an oppressor because he's got power over her. So here's an example where Jesus would say that. In um, Matthew, when we read the familiar verses, turn the other cheek, right? He's telling them, hey, when you're in the presence of an oppressor, this isn't a friend of yours. This is a soldier. You don't know them. They're forcing you to walk a mile. So you didn't get a choice. You didn't get a voice. They're the oppressor. They have power over you. They're forcing you to walk a mile. He says, guess what? You can choose to walk another mile. The same passage, he says, hey, if an oppressor slaps you on the cheek and it's an insulting slap, it's a left-hand slap across the cheek. He says, You can choose to turn the other cheek. What Jesus is saying here is not, hey, it's wonderful for you to to, submit to oppression. What he's saying is, hey, when you are in an oppressive situation, you must remember you have agency because because oppressors try to rob you of your choice. That's their power over you for you to think, oh, I'm helpless. I have no choice. When an oppressor takes your choice and forces you to walk one mile, he's saying, hey, Take your choice back. You can walk too. Peter says the same thing to slaves. He says, slaves who had no choices politically or economically, they were under the authority of their masters. Hey, slaves, when your master treats you cruelly and oppressively, you have a choice on how you're going to handle that. Work as unto the Lord. Still do a good job. You have a choice here. Martin Luther King said the same thing to the African-Americans during the race riots in the 60s, he said, hey, when someone treats you like a nobody, you can still be a somebody, act like one, right? Do the right thing. 
And so this is the this is the beauty of scripture. Jesus isn't saying be a passive victim. He's saying when you are a victim, you still have agency. And that's important to remember. Otherwise, you will be crushed by that person. And he's saying that when this person oppresses you, somebody you don't know, somebody who's a stranger. But a few chapters later in Matthew 18, he says, when your brother or your sister, someone who you're in a relationship with, sins against you, he doesn't say just submit. He says, go talk to them. Yeah. And if they hear you, you've been able to reconcile that relationship. And if they don't hear you, escalate the matter to the church. And this is where the church has made a terrible mistake and kind of doing either nothing or siding with the oppressor. Right. And escalate it to the church and have them help you. And if they still refuse to listen, what Jesus is saying, you have choices here. Don't lose your agency. You have choices. You can now back away from them and treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, which means the close relationship of trust and safety is no longer there. Respect that. See that. Step back. Doesn't mean you're mean to them. It means you don't trust them or feel safe with pagans or tax collectors. You touched a little bit on this, but what is your advice to a woman who's in a domestic violence situation? How does a Christian woman specifically handle this biblically? I think this is really a great question because I think there is a lot of confusion for Christian leaders and Christian women, especially because we put such a high value on the sanctity of marriage, that that sort of blinds us to the sinfulness that's going on inside of that marriage. Just like we have the high value of the sanctity of the church and look what's happened. While we protect the reputation of the church, we've allowed all kinds of sinful, oppressive cover up of sin to happen because we didn't want to tarnish the reputation of the church. We've made terrible mistakes as leaders, covering up abuse allegations, covering up terrible pastors who were actually wolves in sheep's clothing because we didn't want to tarnish the name of the church or, or ruin the reputation of Jesus or that's the excuses we made. We're kind of doing the same thing with marriage. Of course, we value the sanctity of marriage. Of course, God values the sanctity of marriage. But that doesn't mean that we allow a, a rotten marriage, a marriage that's sinful and oppressive to stay under our blessing as an intact marriage when it's full of dead man's bones that God calls us to call that out, to speak the truth in love. So the verse that I use to help women navigate through this, if we can agree that domestic abuse is evil, which I think we can. Yes. All right. That that's evil. It's not God's plan. It's wrong. There's no one, there's no pastor that would say it was okay for him to do this. What they would say is, well, she shouldn't have provoked him or she should suffer for Jesus. That's what they would say. But no person in their right mind would say domestic abuse is God's way for marriage. So let's all agree that for whatever reason, somebody might say they did it. It's always wrong. It's always evil. God never would bless that kind of reaction in a situation. So let's take that verse that Paul tells us in Romans 12, 21. He says, do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So let's just take that advice that Apostle Paul gives us on what, all right, how do we overcome evil? Well, we don't overcome evil by being passive. Overcome is a fighting word. So if he says, do not be overcome by evil, because we can be overcome by evil when evil comes at us, when someone oppresses us, when someone slaps our cheek, when someone forces us to walk a mile, when someone enslaves us, What's, what's going to happen? We are tempted to become bitter. We're tempted to become hateful and revengeful and return some evil of our own, right? And Paul's saying, hey, that's not God's way. Do not allow yourself to become overcome by evil, someone else's evil. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, you do something. You take agency. You overcome evil with what? Good. Well, I think good has been misdefined when we tell a woman, it's good for you to stay married to an evil person. It is not good for you to stay married to an evil person and allow yourself to be oppressed if you can help it, if you have choices, right? And you do have choices in this country. You don't have to do that. But let's just look at what the Bible says. What are your choices? 
Well, the first thing that is good for you to do, it is good for you to get safe. For example, Proverbs 27, 12 says, the prudent see danger and take refuge. You know, in the Bible, God gives us a couple of examples of where he values safety over other things that he says he values. For example, in the Old Testament, remember when the 10 spies went on their spying mission to check out the promised land and they were being hunted down by the people in the city and Rahab hid those spies in her house, which was a house of prostitution. And when the, the soldiers came to her door, she said, oh, they went that way. When in reality, when true, she was hiding them. She knew where they were. She lied. Why did she lie? To keep the spies safe. Even though lying is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie, Rahab was actually saved in that massacre of that city. And she's in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. She was the mother of Boaz. She's in the lineage of Christ because she kept the spies safe. Another example, God values honoring people in authority over you. So we might use that as, well, your husband's an authority over you, so you need to honor him. But when David was under the authority of King Saul, and King Saul began to become jealous of David's ability as a soldier and as a warrior, and everybody was singing David killed his 10,000s and Saul only killed his thousands, and Saul began to get jealous of David, and Saul started to threaten David and want to harm David, God did not tell David, well, just trust me and stay put and I'll take care of you. God mm -hmm. told David to flee and David did flee. And he stayed away from Saul, even though Saul was his authority. Another quick example is in the New Testament. When baby Jesus was born, Herod was jealous, same as Saul, over the possibility that a Jewish king had been born when the wise men told him. And so he was looking for every child under two to kill them because the wise men never came back and told him where he was. And God woke Joseph up in a dream and he said, flee, Herod's trying to kill Jesus. And so if God didn't care about safety and he cared more about honoring the authorities, he would have just allowed that to happen or somehow miraculously protected Jesus. But that's not what he told him, flee. So we know that God says it is good to flee dangerous situations when you're able. And so if you're in a dangerous situation and your children are in a dangerous situation and you're being harmed, it is okay for you to exit that situation and take agency and choose to leave that situation, flee, get out of Dodge, go, go to a shelter, go to your church, go to another organization that can help you save up your pennies, get out of apartment, get a protection from abuse order, do what you need to do to be safe. God honors that. God cares about your safety and he wants you to take action to protect yourself. That is good. That's not sinful. It's not against God. It is a good thing to overcome evil with good. First, protect yourself. Get safe. Second thing, Ephesians 5.11 says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. So the second thing that is good for a woman in an abusive situation to do is understand that she must tell someone the truth. She has to expose the unfruitful deeds of darkness. The Bible tells her it's okay to do that. Even if it's your husband, it is not productive to keep secrets and hide what's going on. So tell someone, tell your church, tell, and unfortunately, oftentimes churches give bad advice, but some are doing better. But if they don't listen, don't stop there. Call your domestic violence shelter. And that number, the 800 number is 1-800-799-SAFE. Call them. They will help you get a safety plan. They will tell you where your local shelters might be able to help you and get some help. Expose the deeds done in darkness. Third, it is good for you to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.24 says, so many women live as if they're lying and pretending about what's going on at home, both to themselves, to their children, to their own family. So much so that later on, maybe 10 years later, when they finally tell, nobody believes them because they've lived in a pretend world in a fake universe for so long about what's really going on. Oh, we have this happy little marriage and we're on Instagram and we're on Facebook and we're taking these family vacations. Meanwhile, she's covering up her bruises or meanwhile, she's knowing he's hurting her and the children in some way or another, whether it's verbally or physically or spiritually or sometimes financially or sexually. And she's 
not telling the truth. It is good for you to tell the truth about what's going on, not on Facebook. Don't put it on Facebook, but tell the truth to people who could help you, the police, the shelter, your counselor, your pastor. The fourth thing, Galatians 6, 7 says that we reap what we sow. And the reason for that is if we sow, if we reap weeds after we've sown weeds, it's a good thing to learn, hey, if I want flowers or vegetables, I better sow vegetables and not weeds. And so if someone reaps a blessing of a household or a relationship, when they're sowing discourse and abuse and financial mismanagement and pornography and sin, and we expect a woman to smile and say, oh, yes, I do want to kiss you. And yes, you're a wonderful man. And I'm going to build you up when you are crashing the family by your behavior. That's not helpful, not only for you as a woman, it's not helpful for him as a man. And so it's helpful when we put our hand on a hot stove and we get burned. That's a helpful lesson to say, I better not do that again. But what we teach Christian women is, hey, grace and mercy mean, oh, you shouldn't separate and you shouldn't have consequences and you shouldn't have boundaries and you shouldn't have things that you, you shouldn't call the police because that's not allowed. And somehow He can just get away with things over and over and over again with no consequences. And you're supposed to still bounce back as a happy little wife, ready to be intimate and love on him and cuddle when he's harmed you. That's not possible without you shutting your entire body down, which isn't good for you. And so allow the abuser to experience the consequences of their behavior. If they didn't go to work, they would get fired. When they're a lousy husband and they're beating you or reviling you or emotionally damaging you or Um, financially mismanaging things or spending money on themselves and leaving you without money for medical bills or food. Let there be consequences there. You don't have a happy marriage, a safe marriage, when you sow all kinds of discord in the house, just like you don't have a clean house when you set it on fire every day. It's going to burn down. So allow those consequences to happen. And fifth, Don't believe words when someone says they're sorry, because once the consequences start coming, they go to jail, you separate, whatever the consequences might be, they're going to say, oh, oh, she's not going to let me get away with this. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. And if you've been around that bend a number of times with an abuser, you know, words don't mean anything. They say them in order to get you to back down from the consequences. That's not helpful. It's not helpful for you, but it's not helpful for them. So if you're really loving your husband as a helpmate, just like you love a child as a, as a mom, you don't let them get away with manipulating you. You don't let them get away with empty promises that you know they're not going to keep. You keep the consequences in place till you see the genuine fruit of repentance. And a really good example of this is in Genesis 42, where we see the story of Joseph who had been betrayed, abused, mistreated, and harmed by his brothers. So this is a family relationship. This is domestic abuse. Joseph is thrown into the pit, sold into slavery, lied about to his father. And when Joseph sees his brothers, how many years later, 30 years later, 20 years later, coming to Egypt and Joseph is Pharaoh's right-hand man, he recognizes them. They don't recognize him. Joseph has grown up. He's not 15 Mm -hmm. anymore. He's 30. And they don't recognize him as a man. But he sees who they are. Now, here's where he practices this. Do not be overcome by evil. They did evil to him. He did not allow his character to become ruined by what his brothers did, but he did not trust them. He did not trust them. He was kind to them because that's who Joseph is. He gave them grain because that's who Joseph was. He cared, but he didn't expose himself to them, make himself vulnerable to them or trust them until he tested them over a series of months, years to see their hearts, to see if they had changed as he had changed. And when he was positive of that, then he finally said, I'm Joseph, but he didn't do that. So please don't let yourself be guilt tripped into reconciling a marriage when there's been no real change in his attitudes toward you, his ways of treating you, even if he promises to do it and he might love bomb you. That's very different than changing his character of control over you. So how do you tell? This would be a really good thing. So. Let's say you've separated 
and he's working real hard to try to win you back and he's being nice to you and he's buying you flowers and he's talking to you nice and you're like oh this is the man I wish he always was I love this man why can't he come home I want him to come home I get it that's really intoxicating isn't it yeah but what you want to watch is is he paying the bills can you check his credit rating can you see what's on the credit card can you see what's on the phone is he calling other people that you don't know about? When you ask, will he tell you? When you say, no, I'm not ready for you to move home yet, does he try to guilt trip you or manipulate you or give you a sob story so that you feel sorry for him? Or does he say, you know what? I respect that. I I'm grateful that you're even giving me a second chance or a 50th chance. Does he receive your no? Or does he try to pressure you, guilt trip you, manipulate you, sweet talk you into removing the consequences, lowering your boundaries so that he can get what he wants. He's still trying to control you, whether it's through harsh means or through loving means, he's trying to control you. So what's really important on your end of the street, if you're a victim of domestic abuse, is that you strengthen your ability to make choices. And when you make choices that he doesn't like, is he able to accept that? When you have your no, is he able to give you your no without mocking you, without criticizing you, without pulling out a Bible verse that you're supposed to be submissive now? You're not godly. You're not following God. You're going to break up our family without accusing you, without attacking you. Because otherwise, it's the same old dance. It's just a different verse. So please be aware of those controls. So these are the good things that you can do. All right. You can get safe. You can expose the deeds of darkness. You speak the truth in love. You allow consequences to occur. Don't be the pillows around him. Let him fall down and let him fall down hard. And watch and wait to see if you see a change of heart, the fruit of repentance, not just empty words before you reconcile. Do you see that happen very often, Leslie? Do you see abusers change? I've seen a few. So I've been in ministry with this 40 years. I've seen a few. I haven't seen a lot. And this is what usually happens. So I don't want to miss, you know, create some sort of fairy tale that if you do this, he's going to repent and change. What I see, two, two tracks will happen as the victim starts saying, oh my gosh, God doesn't want me to be treated this way. And I need to build my own muscles of courage and strength to not let myself be treated this way, regardless of what happens to our marriage, because he has choices too. So as you start to get stronger, you're not working on your marriage right now. You're working on your own safety and your own sanity and your children's safety and sanity. When you start to work on that, that's going to challenge his power over you. Now, he's going to do one of two things. He's either going to respect your growth and grow himself. Or he's either going to get more scary to control you, or he's going to get more covert, more sneaky in trying to control you using maybe more spiritual oppression or more manipulative tactics or alienating the children to get you under his thumb again. Watch for that. Because if he's doing that, you see he's not changing. He may not be hitting you anymore because he doesn't want to be arrested, but he is rolling his eyes. He's still not respecting your no. He's not giving you equal partnership with the money and all of those kind of things. So understand that you're still in an abusive relationship, even if you're not being hit anymore, because he doesn't want to go to jail, or he doesn't want the pastor to know he hit you, he's going to get a little sneakier. This is where you have to keep growing yourself so that you have good boundaries, and you don't allow that to happen. The more that you see what he's doing, and you don't allow that to happen when he's covert, he'll become more aggressive and overt to control you. Or maybe again, he will have the opportunity to wake up and change. But honestly, what most often happens is that you leave him, you're not taking him back, he's tired of this, he's going to go find someone else. And the number of women who scratch their head and say, I can't believe I was so easily replaced. I mean, didn't I mean anything to him? Like, just because I wouldn't reconcile right away, he's dating someone else, he's on all these apps, because you're not a person to him. You really aren't. You are an object. You're an object to use. And if you're not going to let yourself be used anymore, he's going to find someone else to use because his needs are more important than anything else. And that's what he's most interested in, meeting his needs and finding someone to meet his needs, not really working on himself. Once in a while, God does get through and a person does have a heart change, but that's rare. Wow. 
It's kind of sobering and sad. It truly is. And it's not every man. It's these kind of men who have something so broken in them that they can't look at themselves and they can't receive feedback and they're not willing to do the hard work to really change. And the, the sad thing about that is that somehow women who are married to these kind of men are supposed to suffer for Jesus and let the abuse continue. And that would be the absolute wrong thing to do, not only for you, but for him and for your kids. I think it's very interesting to think about if Jesus were to walk into that marriage and in that room, what he would have to say. And it probably would not be suffer for Jesus or suffer for me. <laughs> no, he would, he would be turning the tables over that's like exactly in the right. church, right? <laughs> At the injustice and the oppression. That, that's what was happening in the church. The church was turning into a den of thieves. It wasn't there to help people. It was there to rob people. They were having to pay exorbitant fees to, to the money changers and all that. And so he was like, done with this. I'm not colluding with this as this is a church. This isn't a church. In the same way, I think he'd do the same thing with marriage. This isn't my design for marriage. Stop it. We're not doing this. Leslie, would you pray for women that are in these situations and for church leaders who really need to wake up and learn how to handle these situations in a more biblical way? Lord, we just do pray for any person who's listening today, whether it's a child whose parents are fighting and there is a lot of oppression and control and they don't know what to do, whether it's a woman who knows that they're in an oppressive marriage that's been sanctioned perhaps by their church and they've believed, drank the Kool-Aid themselves, thinking that this is God's will. And this is a terrifying thing to wake up and realize that that's not true. It's a liberating and terrifying thing at the same time, because now you have choices to do something about it. And that scares the daylights out of you, because then what? Then what? Sometimes living in the same old mess is easier than upsetting the apple cart and making a change. So we pray for our listeners today. I pray, especially if there's a leader, a pastoral leader, a counselor, any kind of biblical counselor who's listening to this podcast, that you recognize that God does not sanction oppression in marriage of any kind. He created it to be an equal partnership, a mutual and loving and safe relationship, not a dictatorship or one in which someone is an object to use for another person's purposes. So Lord, I just pray that you would wake us up as friends, that you would wake us up as leaders, that you would wake us up as victims if we are, and that you would wake us up if we're the perpetrators. If someone out there has falsely believed that they're entitled to treat someone harshly because they were provoked or because they didn't do what they wanted, that you would bring them to their knees and see that that is not your way of handling your disappointment or getting provoked by someone. Lord, you want us to love one another and our lives to be characterized by love for one another, not oppressive control, not abusive language, not threats, mistreatment, and abuse, especially in families, especially in families. So Lord, we just pray if there's anyone listening who needs help that she would go for it, they would overcome evil with good, that they would not allow themselves to be infected by evil's poison so that they become the next generation of abusers or victims. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As Leslie said, the first and most important thing you need to do in a domestic violence situation is get safe. Call 1-800-799-SAFE for immediate help. You can also find additional resources at leslievernick.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. And subscribe to Leslie's newsletter to stay up to date on all that's happening with this ministry. Until next time, may God bless your mind, your heart, and your home.